This is Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and it is brought to you by Bet365. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary. At Bet365, I'm Mike Gill. Jeff Mosher joins me today for today's edition of Football at Four. I want to get his uh, thoughts. A lot of people, I don't know if you've heard uh, this Kenny Gainwell uh, audio from, uh, I don't know what podcast he was on. I can't, uh, I apologize. I don't know the name of the podcast. I never heard of the podcast. Somehow he was on a podcast and he was asked about the collapse last season. This is the answer that he gave as to why he felt the Eagles collapsed last year. Take a listen. What do you think? What do you think it was that caused that that sudden change? Um, uh, I think it was a, a connection piece, you know. You know, uh I say teams like the Chiefs, bro, are like well connected, you know, upstairs and downstairs, you know. You know, front office and the locker room. Like, everybody's connected. Um, when you got that connection piece, bro, everything just click. When, you know, you got guys that's not talking to each other, then, you know, you, you never know what's going on, you know. So, like, if we all sit down and talk to each other and find out what's going on or we find out what we need to do on the field yeah. to, you know, get this thing going, then, you know, we'll be good because – if we, if we play real hard in the beginning of the season, we see we need to continue to play hard at the end of the season because at the end of the season would really matter. That's what really matter. That would really matter because when we get to playoff, we're not playing good, and we still got our head down because we just lost five games. Which thing we gonna do in the playoffs? Oh. All right, so that's Kenny Gainwell. It's on the uh, Javian University podcast. I have no idea what that is, but good pull from him getting Kenny Gainwell on the podcast. That being said. He said there was a connection issue, and he lists, like, the Chiefs saying, hey, that's an example of a team that's connected. So do the Eagles have what would be described as a culture problem? Uh, It's a weird conversation to be having about a team that generally is believed to have a good culture from top to bottom. Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast is here. You know, Kenny Gainwell is a guy that, I don't know, do you take his comments with a grain of salt? He's a guy that, it's funny, he's the backup player. But a lot of times in Philly, we love the backup player. But this isn't one of the backup players that fans are clamoring for playing time. So do we look at him as, hey, he might have something here. He might be saying something. Or is this a guy who didn't like his role and is saying, no, I wasn't too happy with my role. And here's some of the disconnects that we had here. Do we look at this as a culture issue that he seems to be pointing out? So I feel like you're asking me two questions in one. And just to be certain, because I haven't heard the entire podcast. Me neither. I did not hear him talking about his role specifically. No, 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 no. You're right about that. I'm just wondering, you know, because there there is that conversation motion. We can get into this as well. Mm-hmm. Of what level of player you need to be to be allowed to, to to complain or open your mouth or say that there's a problem or talk about culture? Do you have to be a star player, a starting player, a Pro Bowl level player, or a backup running back? Like, does the backup <laughs> running back, are, are people okay with him saying, hey, we had problems communicating, that could have been the issue? And then some people say, well, shut up, you're just a backup running back. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. It was similar to like Britton Covey. Oh, it's funny. I remember Dennis Kelly, his first year. Remember, he was like, he was like a what, a day three offensive line pick? Oregon. Of- Oregon. Purdue. Purdue. Dennis Purdue. Kelly. Purdue. Dennis yes. Kelly. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, and, yeah. you know, Sports Illustrated was writing a story about Michael Vick and um, how, you remember 2000, it was either 2010 or 2011, Vick's play, how he's playing and everything like that. And Den- poor Dennis was had to start a few games. Somebody got hurt. And, you know, he was asked about Michael Vick having to take more autonomy over the offense in year two of being the starter. And, I, you know, get Dennis Kelly made some innocuous comment about you know, something about how this is not like a Peyton Manning style offense, meaning Peyton runs that offense, whereas Michael is uh, running what Andy Reid's calling. Right. And it made it was like a pulled quote in Sports Illustrated. And it was taken as if Dennis Kelly was trying to say the quarterback doesn't have a whole lot of responsibility compared to other good quarterbacks. It was all just taken. 
it, it, honestly, I knew Dennis Ken, uh, Kelly uh, pretty well. I got to talk to him a lot. He was just answering a question, right? It, and how everybody reacted to the answer told the story more than the answer itself. And probably Sports Illustrated pulling the quote didn't do him any favors. But I, I do think that there is something to be said for sort of the know your role on a team. But Kenny Gainwell is three years in going into his fourth year, and I think he plays an important enough role as the number two running back and the top short yardage running back and a guy who had a touchdown in the Super Bowl, right, to, to be able to at least give an opinion, which is what he did, um, an opinion through his eyes. on what, He was asked what, what happened to this team, and his opinion through what he observed was that it got to a point where guys stopped talking to each other. There was bad culture, right? So I, I don't look at him and say, shut up, back up, running back. You have no right to say that. Maybe if he was a rookie who never carried the ball, um, you could say that. But I think this is a guy who played in a significant enough role and has been with the team long enough to be able to at least answer that question. And we should listen to it and say, okay, he's basically given us his viewpoint and not crush him for being the backup running back. Because remember, Britton Covey did this exact same thing. Yeah. During he, he did it on your show, your great show that you did on um, Radio Row with him and your great interview. And he was very honest. And he doesn't play a very important role on the team either. And he's just the, the punt returner, you could say. But in my mind, when you listen to him and you take all that context in, they're just laying out to you what was going on with the team and why there was so much discord and dysfunction. Yeah, I don't um, think because he's the backup running back and doesn't have a big role. He was in the locker room, um, so mm-hmm. he does. He has seen it and has been a part of it. I guess part of it is, look, Fletcher Cox, I could ask the same question to. Fletcher might be cognizant enough as a high-profile player to say, I'm not getting into this. Whereas Kenny Gainwell, maybe Britt and Covey are saying stuff, and people are like, well, why are you stirring the pot? You guys are lower roster players. There's no need to do this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think if I think it's different. Uh, but what stood out to me is that he didn't name a name. It, you know, if he went out and said, you know, man, Jalen Hurts was a terrible leader, or Fletcher Cox and Jalen Hurts hate each other, or, you know, I'm just making up stuff, right? Or Lane. Johnson and Fletcher Cox couldn't stand each other. They weren't. Then, then that's problematic. Now you're naming names. You're you're br- inviting the public to know about certain beefs. I, the way Kenny described it was basically what everybody saw and what everybody had known. We had done reports on this. You know, whether it was us or Inquirer or anybody else, that by the end of the year, the Eagles were not a cohesive team. It wasn't just players. We talked about the coaching staff. The switch of defensive coordinators, how that impacted the players, how you had guys running different schemes. Uh, we, I know on our show we talked about how some of the guys didn't like Sean Desai very much, the veterans, right? I mean, none of this was new. So I don't even see he, – he was answering a question. Could he have just decided to say, I'm not going to talk about that? Sure, but I don't think the way he said it or what he said brought anything new to light. And right. I don't think it – you know, I, I just I don't I know I know he's been crushed for it, and I, and I wouldn't crush him for it. Yeah, no, and I think it's a fair conversation to get that out to say, okay, so here's a guy that we should value his opinion. He's a player on that team who saw stuff. Uh, he says, I think it was a connection. So I guess the next question is, what do we read into that? Like, one of the reasons we think Nick Sirianni still is here is because he has this culture. They like playing for him and all that stuff. Are we starting to question that? Um. I think it's a little too early to question all of that. I mean, I think it's a fair question because, you know, why is he here? He's here because he's he, he builds himself as a connections guy. Right, right? exactly. But let, let's be fair. Like, you, you know, I could be a connections guy. It doesn't mean every single year, every single guy I'm going to connect with. It. There's going to be there's going to be times where true colors are revealed. Right. And the Eagles were losing games and they were already having issues with the coaching staff, especially on defense. Right. And they were having, well, they were having their fair share of offensive issues too. And you see this pretty much any time with a big market team that starts to lose, you're going to find the cracks, right? You're going to find people who are mad. You're going to find personalities who talk about it, you know, maybe off the record. So I, I, I think when I think of teams that have cultural issues, I see long-term fractures like Washington for so many years had culture issues that started with ownership, right? Um, And there are other issues. I can't look at seven weeks of the Eagles of a three-year Nick Sirianni era and say 
that is a reflection that they have a culture issue. Because I think that if you start winning, then that hides it up. Although I do think it's fair to say even at 10 and 1, we were talking about some of the issues there. But obviously Nick Sirianni is going to have to get this team back on track. And, and Mike, it will, you'll, you'll hear in our podcast tomorrow that we drop, we start doing our early 53-man pro, uh, projection. Um, we did offense. And what shocked me was just how new the Eagles are, how many new faces at a lot of positions. So that will breed its own new culture anyway. Well, and like, you know, this team went to the Super Bowl two years ago. Did they not have a good culture then? And a lot of it is winning. When you win, the bad parts of your personality don't have more chances to come out. When your team's losing, they might have had the same personality then, but no reason for the bad part of it to come out when your team is winning a lot. When you go through multiple weeks of losing, you start to see guys. So it doesn't mean that the culture has changed. It just meant there was more opportunity for things to be different. Yeah, and I and I think, you know, last year is still fresh in a lot of people's minds. And I think your listeners, our listeners, our viewers, your viewers, those who have watched enough football, you know, of a certain age, can remember last year at 10-1 and one, thinking, boy, this team seems to have a lot of resolve, a lot of metal. I mean, they've been tested and they didn't blow out anybody in that 10-1 that and one stretch. But also, how many times were we like, I can't believe – that they got away with this. I can't believe that they, they left three guys uncovered in this game, yet still won, right? You know, so so there were there were early signs last year that this was not the Super Bowl team. There was a lot of new guys brought in, especially on defense. There were new coordinators. Um, there was just a whole lot of newness, and there were a lot of wins that didn't feel good. I know every win is supposed to be a good win in the NFL, but after the year before, um, I think we all knew in September or in October, that there was something a little bit different about this kind of 10-0 and team or 10-1 and team compared to some others. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny you say that because um, there was a time last year that when people said they thought the Eagles were the best team in football, it was because they won ugly, they found ways to win, and, and that that was a sign of a good team. Is it? You just hey, I remember the time they beat uh, Dallas, the game where mm-hmm. Dak stepped out of bounds and they make the tackle at the one-yard line, and it's you know, the Eagles will say, get into a fight with us. Bare knuckle fight us. But we dare you to. They make you play their style of football. And wherever that went, I don't know what happened to it, but for, through that game it was like, we will make you play our style of football. And people were uncomfortable doing it. And I think one of the things Britton Covey said at the Super Bowl was, we kept doing that, doing that, and we didn't really change. And other teams were evolving, and we weren't. Yeah, I, I remember <laughs> – I remember sort of joking around after that Dallas game and calling it the win that felt like a loss, right? Because the last eight, the last quarter of that game, I mean, it was just a a complete implosion and it took Dallas pulling off its own Dallas, right. To, to really hand the Eagles the win there because they, they made every mistake possible. So you felt good about escaping with a win, but sort of bad about the trend that they had started of just not, being able to put it all together in one game and, and nearly costing themselves. And I think that a week after Mike was that San Francisco game, if I'm not mistaken, where the dam finally broke on them and all the flaws that they had were exposed by a really good team that wasn't going to implode the way Dallas did. And then once the dam was broken, it got ugly. Yeah. Uh, because it's just weird to hear about culture issues. Cause it's one thing that seems like Philadelphia has kind of been steady is that they have the same ownership group, the same general manager, like they don't have the constant turnover where, hey, we're firing the GM because he made a bad pick. We didn't hit on the quarterback. Let's bring a new guy in here. They've had such stability. And throughout the extent of the ownership and the GM, it it, it seems that that has been one thing you can always say about Philadelphia, that they're well run, the culture's good there, and they generally win. Yeah. I think the sort of uniquely fascinating thing you can say about the Eagles is, to your point, is that the ownership and and upper management has been able to establish a good culture quite often. But 
when the culture is bad, it also has its way of tracing back to the ownership and the upper management. So uh, they can give it and take it away pretty quickly. Right. Well, it's the theory of, you know, these guys have been here too long and, you know, uh, th- that uh, they get complacent. But that happens every once. Like, it feels like, what, once every, like, three years or four years that they have, like, a year where you're like, where did that come from? But you're more yeah, surprised. Yeah. And look, we're talking about a year in which they went to the playoffs and had double digit wins as where did that come from? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you know, every once in a while, then you start like, you know, there's a Jeffrey Lurie press conference where you're feeling great about the team and how he and how he feeling great about the team. Then you have a, a Jeffrey Lurie press conference and he's asked about like being too influential in the draft process. And he goes, No, no, no. I was never involved in well, that Ortega right side pick. I was only involved in the Jordan Maialata and the Lane Johnson. Uh, yeah. Well, did you watch? Did you watch the video of when they showed the video of him trying to work the deals out to get Cooper DeJean? Yeah. Was it was it not obvious how much Jeffrey Lurie was in there? I mean, and a he's part of it too, you know, like he's literally it? sitting in the seat next to him asking questions, and Roseman's yeah. almost like. Oh my god! I have to answer this idiot right now. Like I'm in the middle of trying to make a deal. Like, come on, dude. Like, did you get that sense? I laugh when um, Je- I forget what Jeffrey suggested. Right? He said something, and Howie's like, "Yeah, but we don't want to do that right now." And Jeffrey goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. That's not what I meant." Yeah, exactly. That's what, what I was talking about. Yes, where he's it was. like, "That is exactly what you meant. Yeah. You just, you just got cold." Yeah, almost like, hey, <laughs> it's like uh, the, the the listener guy who tweets at me. They should have drafted Trotter right now, and Rose was like, no, 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 not right now. And Rose yeah. and, and Laura's right. like, oh yeah, 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 no, right, you're, you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> like we could get him, we yeah. could get him two rounds later. Don't worry about that. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to be fair. <laughs> speaking of Cooper <laughs> DeGene, uh, he was on the Up and Adams podcast uh, earlier today. Uh, he talked about his possible role, and he said he went at, to the mini camps the rookie uh, mini camps last weekend, and that they used him only at outside corner and in the slot, but there has been talk about him playing safety and a returner. I want to ask, though, about outside corner. Do you see, Mosh, a scenario where he is getting a majority of his reps at that position this year? This year, no. This year, no. So... I'm not going to slam the door on it. Um, I, I would say, I would say, let's say Darius Slay gets hurt. Okay. okay? And you got Quinion Mitchell starting. I, I still don't know if Bradbury is going to be on this team or not. We'll see. But let's say he's not. Bra- well, okay. Well, let's say if Bradbury is on the team, he's essentially the third guy behind those two. Yeah. You would, you would think, you would think, um, unless Vic Fangio creates some sort of, hybrid role for him in nickel in nickel and dime packages. And right? not to say, look, you shouldn't play him at outside or get looks at him at outside corner. It's just like, hey, how do I maximize this guy for this year? Why I have him? Do you see him playing outside corner? I, I kind of agree with you. I don't know how that's possible unless there's multiple injuries. Yeah, you can only play two. And right now, Darius Slay's on the team and Quinion Mitchell is on the team. And uh, those are going to be your outside corners. Now, if Slay gets hurt or if Slay has a James Bradbury like uh, 2024 season like Bradbury had in 2023 and you're looking for somebody who can get in there and, and stop the bleeding, yeah, yeah. Let me let me tell you, like, th- I know I've talked about his – long. people have said his long-term position is probably safety, but there are people who think he can play corner just fine in the NFL. Yeah. Um, I don't think that people think he can, he'd be ideal, say, if you're playing corner in a in – a, um, a Wink Martindale defense where you're constantly one on one because you're blitzing six, seven, eight guys all the time. But in a heavily zoned defense, like he played in Iowa, I mean, that's where he played in Iowa and he was a good player. He's a really good player in Iowa. So um, I absolutely see an open door to him playing the outside. I just think that that's probably a year, two, or three discussion while you have both, while you have Darius Slay on, on the roster. Right. And, and, the other thing would be, do you and have you heard people look at him as a nickel? Yes. So yeah, absolutely. So it's a possibility that they could say we could play him as the nickel slot guy full time. A hundred percent possible. So yeah, that would be that. that would not be a surprise to you. Yeah, the guy's a top forty pick, right? So th- the idea is that if as long as the skills translate. He should be one of your best players in the set. I mean, how many guys 
in the Eagles secondary are either pro bowlers or top 40 picks. I, I don't have a problem with him. If he, if he, <laughs> if he won that position and he was the guy, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, right. I guess the other question, he said they have talked about safety. Um, that, that would be another thing. It's like, I guess it's one of these things. I talked about Cody Ashy playing third base the one year, and oh, yeah. it was like, you know the guy's moving to left field. How did you give him no reps? So in the middle of the year, they had to send him to AAA to go play left field. It's like you did the guy a complete disservice. I just don't want to see that happen with this kid where, hey, your best chance to make an impact might be at this position, but we're not going to look at you there until maybe down the road. Yeah, you don't want to Cody. You don't want to Scotty Kingery him. You don't want to Cody Ash him. You don't want even. Didn't they do this with Reese Hoskins or no Ryan Howard? One of those guys. Didn't they want to try to put Reese those Hoskins guys, uh, played left field the one year he was terrible. That's right, exactly. Yep. So he, no, um, the good thing is, is this guy has can and has the ability to play multiple positions. So it wouldn't be like you're stunting his growth. I don't think. I I, I you want to get him out there. Yeah, you he want also the to help you. He also. Um, suggested that they talk to him about being a punt returner. So that's something that's, uh, that's in the mix as well. But uh, yeah, he's he's, probably, man. I mean, he was like a, a, you know, one of the better punt returners in the league last year really came into his own. And now they bring in Aeneas Smith, the wide receiver, who's a punt returner, bring in Cooper to They bring in um, a couple of other guys who have had that ability to be a returner. Isaiah Rogers has a return ability. And now you're looking at the receiver spot, you know, and it's like, are they keeping, six just to keep Covey when they have all these other returners? I don't know. I yeah. think it's a good well, it's a good conversation I, on Inside the Birds uh, tomorrow morning. Well, we brought it up Monday. I asked you about how the, the return right. game is going to change because of all this. Um, two well, quick, you were talking kick return, though, correct? The kick returning rules changing, yes, that having more of an impact. Um, the punt returner, that, that, that stays the same in the Eagles – Obviously, have had Britton Covey do that. Gainwell, uh, no, Boston Scott did the kick returning, but that position is going to be more prevalent this year. couple quick yeah. notes. Uh, Brandon Hunt is mm-hmm. interviewing for the Patriots job, but just another in the long line of guys. He's the Eagles director of scouting, but it's another in the long line of guys who are like faceless and nameless behind the scenes that other teams just keep coming after in the Eagles. For all. It's like Philadelphia radio stations coming after my talent down here. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, no comment on that one, right? <laughs> no, um, let's see. Uh, Brandon Hunt's getting an interview in New England. Uh, yeah, let, let's sort of, I mean, yes, there have been a lot of interviews. I don't know, ever since um, Andrew Berry left, right, for, for Cleveland and Catherine Rach left, there's been interviews, but no, I don't think, and Brandon Brown to the Giants, it's been a little slower. I, I, I'd be very surprised if the Patriots, just based on talk discussions of people around the league, they had Elliot Wolf there running their draft, and it was probably their most important draft in 20 years, right? I mean, they've drafted a quarterback. They brought in Alonzo Highsmith, who was with Elliot Wolf in Green Bay, I believe. So you got to think that all signs are pointing to Wolf keeping that job or getting the promotion and the title. But yeah, they're going to cast in that. They're going to interview uh, a couple of people. And Brandon Hunt has been interviewed a lot. Um, you know, he's interviewed for a GM job and with the Raiders, he interviewed with the GM job for the Steelers, which went to Omar Khan. Then he came over to the Eagles two years ago, right around this time. Uh, I'd be a little surprised if he got the Patriots job and won't slam the door on it. But it is, yeah, you're right. It is another example of the Eagles' template getting looked at by other teams. Yep, and uh, that seems to be a uh, something that's like a yearly tradition now. I'll give you the over/under on Saquon Barkley, uh, one thousand point five. 1,005 is the over-under for the rushing totals for Saquon Bar- Barkley. I guess the question would be, is that disappointing to hear that they set the number at 1,000? I don't think so based on his injury history. I mean, I, people – I listen, <laughs> I'm not here to uh, slander Saquon. I, I think he's fantastic uh, for the most part. I do think that there are things he can do better. But he's been in the league six years. He is – made it to that mark a thousand or more three times, right? The other three times he's had 34 yards, 593 yards. And last year he was a little under at 962. So if you want to take the 962 and then one of the years he was 1003, right? So that would be under the mark your test. So two out of the six years, which is a third of the 33% of the time he's reached that under, or is it even more if I count the year he had 34 yards? So the point is 
the history says that that's probably a pretty fair number to go with because it's not about it's more about opportunity based on health than it is about what you're going to do if you have the ball in your hand. It's fair, I guess, based on those factors. But if you signed him for the money you did and got a thousand yard guy, you had that already. Uh, yeah, I mean, the only other thing, unless you're adding like 500 and something receiving yards to it and giving me 1,500 total yards, then you'll live with the 1,005 rushing yards. Touche. Jeff Mosher, <laughs> check out the Inside the Birds podcast on all podcasting platforms. Sounds like they have a good one coming out for you uh, in the next edition. Get that uh, wherever you listen to your podcast. And don't forget to check out their YouTube channel. Just search Inside the Birds. Mosher, we'll talk to you next week, man. All right, have a great one, Mike. Uh, Andrew's in tomorrow for uh, football at 4 o'clock.